Hi everyone, welcome to In Limbo Conversations. And uh, today we have with us uh, Dr. Professor Christopher Tyndale from University of Windsor. And uh, we're gonna be his primary area of research is argumentation theory, rhetoric, and Greek philosophy. And we're gonna be talking with him uh, about these research work in relation to uh, the pandemic situation going on. Please look at the video description for more details. Also, I have with me my colleague, Alan Isaac. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Christopher. Uh, so uh, I'll get to the first question. Um, in the current pandemic situation, there are many debates which are going on where the sites could resort to using rhetoric. When do you think that the use of such rhetoric could be considered unethical or considered to be a form of manipulation? Mm. Yeah, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's an interesting question because most people think any use of rhetoric is a form of manipulation. And so <clears throat> there, are, there are elements of <clears throat> rhetorical theory that really recognize the respect of those that we're, we're talking to. If we go back to the roots of this in the philosophical tradition, we would go back to Aristotle and Aristotle's rhetoric. And it's quite clear there at the beginning of his rhetoric that although he wants to explore every aspect of rhetoric, including the exploitative sense of it, he is really addressing the ethical components of uh, rhetorical theory. So for example, his rhetor has to be someone <clears throat> who um, exhibits goodwill. So you know it and has to exhibit virtue and has to exhibit practical reasoning, phrenesis. So there's a relationship for Aristotle between his rhetoric and his ethics. You know, and it's, that's quite clear. And I think that needs to carry through. <clears throat> that got lost somewhere in the Western tradition. Uh, I think maybe around the time of Peter Ramus, where he started to shift attention to logical theory and was worried about some of the <clears throat> things that went on with, with rhetoric. But in the recovery of, of rhetoric in the last oh, 50, 60 years by rhetoricians and now by philosophers, there is the, the need to look at it from what I think of still as that Aristotelian tradition where one treats people with respect, you know, you, so you give them the full information, you don't try to exploit their uh, weaknesses in terms of only giving them um, partial information and things of this, of this nature. So it is a, a form of really invitational communication, inviting people into, um, into a conversation and recognizing them as um, you know, real legitimate audiences, people that are worth talking to, right? When you engage in that kind of uh, encounter with individuals, you're respecting them as um, autonomous individuals that can uh, contribute something to the conversation. So I know that's a roundabout way to, to address that question, but it's to sort of go back to the roots in our tradition, in fact, it's, it's not there at all. Okay, so I was thinking that, you know, in, in, as a follow up, I was thinking that uh, given the, like in your paper also, you had mentioned it, uh, that, you know, uh, generally the power, there's a power relationship between the speaker and the listener often, like in the case of using a visual image of the hero, where we are trying to invoke people to, you know, uh, to, towards a rhetoric of care from a rhetoric of struggle. And when you're talking there, so there is a certain power relation where people hold the doctor as an authority. So how do you think the power relation between the participants in a debate, say like a doctor and her patients, or a government and its citizens, how does it affect our, the ability of the listeners to reason? Oh, well, it, um, it's, it, it does affect them, of course. And few people really look at the, uh, the inequities in the relationships between communicators that are at work there. So uh, many of us come from um, traditions, I know in my own parents, for example, had uh, a kind of unthinking respect for authorities. They would never question authorities. And now we've, we've shifted over the last uh, generation or so, to, uh, the opposite extreme where authorities now become um, um, uh, subjects of real suspicion and, and obviously some of the political um, voices have encouraged that kind of suspicion. 
And what's happening now, I think, in this pandemic, that you know, people are really torn on this because they've been led to um, suspect the experts to a certain degree, but now they're they're kind of caught up because they're they need to look at these experts. And part of the conversation we now see is that well, the experts are saying this and that. You know, they're listening to the experts, but they're they're concerned that there isn't a a, a voice of of consensus there. So um, <clears throat> that's. I think a, a kind of recovery of the ownership of the uh, of the issue, um, where people are asserting their own authority, and the web does this quite readily. Of course, it gives um, it, it's it's more egalitarian than many of our other uh, platforms for uh, communication that we've seen before. So it treats people in uh, in a more equal you know, equal way, and. Uh, and allows them to think seriously about the nature of authority here. And I, you know, I, as I talk there in that paper about the rhetoric of care, of course, um, we have seen how uh, medical authorities um, have really presented these, these arguments by putting forward figures that are recognizable and uh, figures of respect. In, in that sense. So the, the nurse who wears a mask, she becomes and the, the new hero, you know, the hero of, of today. Whereas in the past, she's, she was just uh, another professional who fell back into the, into the background, really. Right, okay. Yeah. So uh, I was wondering, how is the relationship? So if I'm someone who does not know much about like the coronavirus, I do not know the the biological aspects of what it means to have the virus, the symptoms. And so if, as someone who does not, uh, you know, uh, know how to sort of uh, read the, like, you know, I cannot see if the evidence, I have to check the research to know if the evidence really matches up to the claims that are being made. So for someone like that, what are the kind of uh, fallacies you generally see readers making when they are reading a social media post or a news? So what are generally, uh, do you see people making? Oh, um... Yeah, that's a problem. We're all vulnerable to the uh, inadequacies of our own background, right? And we don't have the information we need. And so uh, we rely on authorities quite readily. And I think people fail to recognize that, that the, the whole notion of testimony is crucial to our, um, our epistemic lives. You know, we, we draw on from, from very young age, of it, from the earliest age, we draw on the testimony of others, people that we, uh, we respect. And much of what we learn, we learn through these kinds of, of, uh, of sources. So of course that also then creates a kind of um, ideological base or um, a belief system at work in us so that sometimes there's a clash uh, between you know what now the culture is trying to present to us which is the evidence of these kinds of concerns and our own ideological perspectives and i think you see that you see that for example in the mask debate that's going on um, where the the actual scientific um, aspects of the, that argument are hiding deeper ideological um, beliefs about um, freedom, you know, my ability to do whatever I want to do, irrespective of uh, uh, the what's imposed upon me in, in this in this way. And so, I um, to get to your question, I, I commit perhaps selective fallacies. I only see what I want to see in an issue. Um, I create very quickly straw men. Um, or straw person uh, reasoning because I assume that what I'm hearing is the same old argument and I jump in very quickly and I, I so there's a failure to listen there to listen to the other person to go back to what I said in response to your first question you know to respect the other individual as someone who's worth listening to and I, I hastily draw a, a conclusion. So I, I'm, I'm committing all kinds of fallacies here. I've got the hasty generalization, right? I rush to a conclusion here. I commit some straw reasoning because I assume that the position I'm, I'm hearing is a position I know how to caricature and it's not um, uh, at all. And I'm, I'm really quite selective in, in what I'm reading. And that and that all feeds from the belief system that has sustained me over time and which is now being challenged, 
right? We're, what we've got is this remarkable situation where everyone in the world is suddenly faced with the same um, prospects. Right. So, uh, Political authority or no authority at all, uh, they're, they're suddenly thrown into a completely new environment where all the rules have changed and they have to find their way. And from, from a philosophical point of view, that's a really interesting um, social experiment to watch uh, playing out. You, you, you couldn't ethically conduct such an experiment, but suddenly the world has created it for us. Yeah. So do you think that the use of rhetoric, since we are using it uh, specifically for the emotions, do you think in some way that makes some uh, people more prone to making these fallacies? Do you think there's a certain, uh, like the nature of rhetoric in itself could be prone people? Well, yes, um, unavoidably so, right? Um, we are not, we are rhetorical beings. I mean, we're ethical beings, we're political beings. We go back to all the, the ways in which we are, you know, epistemic beings. We overlook the fact that we are rhetorical beings. We are open messages. We, um, uh, we, we are communicators on every level. So given that, and this is, that's a neutral aspect of our social being, uh, given that, then yes, we are, are vulnerable to uh, committing fallacies, to falling into some of the cognitive biases that then lead uh, to fallacies. This is unavoidable. It's part of the the give and take, you know, the um, uh, the giving and taking of reasons in the marketplace of uh, reasons, as uh, Robert Brandon talks about this. Um, it's yeah, it, we we cannot avoid moving into that that marketplace. And so we are going to always be vulnerable. And that's why um, the study of uh, argumentation, rhetoric, you know, philosophical reasoning is important because it allows us to protect ourselves against these, um, these natural risks, I suppose. Um, professor, so there is this, um, continuing with the whole theme of the pandemic and uh, the different groups that you uh, tend to see, uh, so like you mentioned, like in your paper, there are certain groups that uh, try to, uh, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but you can say they're trying to push a narrative or to trying to sort of shape a narrative in a certain sense. And there's another group that is using their rhetoric to shape a certain other narrative. Yeah. So uh, do you see, since especially since your work is uh, deals a lot with the audience also, from what I've yeah. seen, Yes. Uh, do you see these people also, there's a greater awareness of the audience nowadays, especially with social media and all the different things. You tend to know who your audience is like never before, probably. Now you have different parameters to see who they are and what they, their social groups and all of those things. Do you, do you see a lot of that factoring into uh, modern day rhetorical practices in that sense? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Does that a lot more? Um, you can't con you know you can't control the narrative unless you're you're fully aware of those who are, are being addressed and those who are going to be influenced or you're trying to influence by what you're saying, and that's a real shift um, for those that have looked at argumentation in the past. There's been a tendency to focus on the product of argumentation, which is, which is an argument, right? And that's one of three aspects of the argumentative situation. The other is, of course, the, the arguer, whoever she is, or, or it could be a group, uh, and the audience. Right? So when we look at the argument, we sort of lift it out of context and we evaluate it and, and, and talk about, you know, whether it's, it has, um, you know, a, a sound structure and things of this nature. But um, that fails us in these kinds of situations. And you could say, well, look, you know, these audiences, here we have good arguments. They should be persuaded by those arguments. But um, that's just looking at an argument as an, in, you know, an internal relationship of propositions, which the logician is able to test and tell us if it's good or bad. In the actual context of ordinary reasoning, uh, what we find then is that um, you know, what's it's hard to mention before, and what you're mentioning now, the emotional um, aspect comes into play, the, the character of the audience is, is crucially important. And these are elements that are gonna impact whether good reasons are adopted or not. 
right? Um, and Aristotle made this point and Ar others have made the point that, you know, we have to recognize that some audiences don't get good argument. They don't get it. So um, if we're going to um, interact with them with goodwill, with practical reasoning, these other um, important components, we need to recognize where they are, uh, appreciate that different audiences are going to respond in different kinds of ways and, and move from that base, right? So you start not with, um, with a solid argument and then try and put it into a context. You go into the context and look at what's, what's at work there. What are the assumptions? What are the, what are the belief systems that are operating within that audience? So you have to know that audience and then uh, you work from that environment and, and uh, with, with the ideas that uh, are in, uh, already operative there. So we don't reason in a vacuum. Right? Uh, and that's uh, often the, the logic class encourages the thought that we might, you know, <laughs> we, we take an example and we look at it, and is it a good argument? Uh, whereas when we actually reason, we reason there's a history. Right? There, and there's a social component to that reasoning. Uh, people respond to arguments because of how they've responded to previous arguments, how they think about that issue, how they've been engaged in a debate. And that, that's what we mean by understanding the audience. And that has to be recognized and work with as we, uh, as we move forward. The failure to do that is the, is the failure to uh, really address the argumentative situation in what um, John Austin the speech act theorist would have would have called the the total speech situation you know that that's what we're looking for uh, so thank you for that professor that's that's a very uh, sort of wouldn't say new but that's quite a in-depth look at that so I never thought about that way so that's quite nice I was wondering more in the sense that in today's world, you have a lot of, have you seen any differences that the digital media itself makes to the arguments or the way that people, is there a shift in that sense from the traditional sort of senses of uh, rhetoric that is used? Or is it the same thing in like, a, like they say on steroids or something? Is it like doubly amplified or something? Or is it, is it, the, is it a sort of new thing? Is there anything new that you see because of the way we both consume uh, media nowadays or consume uh, news and all of these things, or is it just the same thing in a different uh, skin, I guess? I don't know. No, there, there are very many different aspects and people are really only touching the surface of studying how uh, moving to the internet and the World Wide Web um, changes um, communication generally, because it's it's more difficult to know what your audience is. So some of the theorists, uh, I've done some work on the uh, Belgian philosopher Kain Perelman, for example, and, and he, he's quite influential in my my own work. But he he defines an audience as those uh, who the arguer is trying to influence. Right now, um, that it means that the arguer has a very specific conception of who his or her audience is. You can't do that on, on, the, uh, on the internet. As we were talking before, that the plus of this is that it's, more, it's a more egalitarian environment. It treats people equally. Uh, but then of course, what we recognize is that people don't necessarily have the resources, the background to engage equally in a, um, in, in a debate. And there's also the what I've you know sometimes call with my um, students the Gollum effect because they've all watched the movies of the Lord of the Ring, and um, so they they know this character Gollum who who puts on a ring and disappears, and the internet allows you to do that. Right, the internet allows anonymity uh, and a dangerous kind of anonymity, um, so we become invisible. Uh, we, we can choose to be visible, right? We're, the three of us are really quite visible now, but we could have conducted this without um, identifying ourselves. We could have conducted this without uh, video and uh, all kinds of ideas can float around there that, that don't have real sort of ownership. And that's the danger of this, right? So now we're dealing with conceptions of audience which are difficult to track down. Um, I, it's, it's similar to the 
the problem that arises when we look at historical audiences. So when, um, when a, a, a Plato writes, right, Plato couldn't imagine us. So Plato is writing for an audience, but now we, you know, generation after generation after generation, they pick up the Republic and they read it and they, they understand it for them, right? But of course, what um, previous generations understood in the Republic, what we understand and what Plato might have meant, intended, uh, may be quite, quite different. So that's, I think, comparable to the kind of thing that's now happening on, um, in virtual environments where you, the arguer really does lose control of her or his message material. And it becomes very much, uh, it comes back to what I said before about us being rhetorical beings where we, um, we're, we, we kind of register the things which are for us, you know, Why? Well, that's an interesting thing to study and to think about, you know, why I'm, I'm drawn more to this or to that. And, um, and that leads us into then a very different um, study of audiences. So I, as I, it's a good question. As I said, it's, we, I think, only started to scratch the surface of understanding how uh, moving to in virtual environments modifies a lot of the um, assumptions that we've made about how communication and argumentation works. So I think this also kind of harkens back to what you were saying a few questions before about context, like especially when you take the Plato example, Plato had a context, his readers had a context, and even when we read them now, we build up that context, I think a lot, in order to follow those arguments and that kind of thing. But like you pointed out in the internet, it's almost impossible in some cases to even have a context. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, that kind of becomes quite troubling. But yeah, I think that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. context is one of those words, concepts that we bandy around and everyone thinks they understand what it means, but it's, it's a very difficult concept. And um, yeah, and, and this sort of illustrates, you know, what, what components make up a context. Well, again, we're, we're still talking and studying those kinds of things. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, 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 I was just moving on. But uh, so I... I guess I have one more question, possibly in relation to this. I'm not sure if there's a solution to this question that I'm asking, but I would like to get your thoughts about it as somebody who is who has studied rhetoric and has uh, looked at the audiences, uh, at it from the audience's perspective, possibly from the audience. Uh, nowadays, we have a lot of conflicting information, and every day there is something new that comes up with relation to the pandemic with relation to health regulations or what is safe, what is not safe. And uh, without going into larger issues of truth or post-truth and all of that, in general, like uh, how does, how, how do you, what are your thoughts on how an audience would react to this constantly changing, this constant flux of information where you're not able to hold on to anything certainly, there is no certainty. What, kind, what sort of long lasting effects does it have, if any? on somebody who's experiencing this, like step up, step, you see something new today, et cetera. Yeah, I think it should have long lasting effects because it, as I said to, to an, a number of questions, what this whole situation is doing is challenging a lot of the assumptions about the way um, so-called so ordinary life operates and how we go about our business. So we, um, we move through a whole sort of networks of uh, communication and uh, we make assumptions about what we can trust and what we can't trust. And now those, those assumptions are being challenged. So people have had to become more, uh, I think, more wary. Um, they uh, become, I wouldn't say more suspicious, but more skeptical in the positive sense of skepticism. If we go back to the history of skepticism, where you, you hold things in abeyance and you're all continuously weighing um, the strengths of the, of the positions you're getting, but you're not definitively you know, closing off um, the, these questions. I think it, it has the potential of creating um, as a, a more um, positively skeptical um, citizenry. 
who uh, become aware of their need to defend themselves against you know, f false information and how they can best do that. Maybe it's um, a turn back to the principles of critical thinking, to you know, studying critical thinking, to learn how to become uh, good judges of, of information, how to weigh evidence um, and how to trust sources. So that a whole, again, assumptions about who qualify as experts, which experts can be trusted, um, really then it's, um, it's, it's drawing attention to ourselves as um, you know, autonomous epistemic beings in the social world and how we operate that, uh, that in, in that environment. That's what's being um, questioned and, and potentially uh, a more positive way forward uh, we'll, we'll follow from this because we've learned that we cannot just um, accept everything we we hear uh, day by day. We've got to, we, we need certain kinds of filters, uh, what I think of as critical thinking filters, and we need to have them in place and uh, clearly operating. So, yeah. Professor, I would assume that, uh, I, I would assume that there should be a space for this kind of thing in, in pedagogy, not just at say a research level once you reach university or something, but even maybe we start doing this at a younger age to our uh, students and kids and sort of get them aware of rhetoric so that it, we can ingrain them a bit. Yeah, absolutely, uh, not just rhetoric, but um, you know, critical thinking, um, in what we call at Windsor informal logic, because the University of Windsor is well known as a place where informal logic uh, has developed. And we have, um, indeed, we have a PhD program in argumentation studies. And a number of students in that program are interested in, um, in pedagogy, in you know, how to take some of the skills they're learning about critical thinking and, and put it into the curriculum at various levels. So yes, those kinds of, uh, um, of studies are, are, are operating. It's not just the, what we do at our level, um, but you know, how early on in the, um, in the, in the, in the life of the mind, you know, can we instill uh, this, um, this, this critical um, attitude that, that we're, we're thinking of here. And uh, indeed, uh, the, the whole um, program of philosophy for children, of course, uh, looks at this and there's a, an important component of critical thinking at work in that movement as well. Indeed. Thank you, Professor. I, yeah, I think that's, that's all the questions I have. Sana, do you have any questions you'd like to ask? Uh, no, I don't have any questions, uh, Professor. Well, thank you so much for doing this with us. I've enjoyed this. I, I kind of, it, when you're asking questions like this and I'm thinking about the answers, then it helps me to clarify my own thinking on some of these things. So um, it's not, it's, uh, it's a two way. So uh, I would love to see a good reasoning matters book about just the pandemic related exercises, a of exercises from pandemic related social media posts and visual images. And that we that are working on a, yeah, we are working on the sixth edition right now. And we are putting in examples from this situation, indeed. That sounds good. That's good. One of my, I thought it might be too facile a question, so I was thinking not to ask. I was going to ask, do you have any uh, one or two practical things that people can take back in order to deal with the current situation, like how to identify misinformation or maybe how to better navigate the flow of information we have? But no, it's good that you have a book. Maybe they can refer to that. Yeah, but we have a book. And, and generally, of course, you know, don't go with the first source and don't just read sources that fit your ideological perspective. You know, try to um, engage the other position, the position which you might otherwise you know, disagree with. Because, you know, they're, they're intelligent people on all sides of the debate. And, uh, and that's what makes a society interesting. Right. If we, if everyone thought the same way, uh, you know, you might think, yeah, if everyone thought like me, that would be a, a better world, right? But really, uh, when we give that a little bit more attention, we realize, no, that's not a world I'd find attractive, 
right? I want pushback. I want people who disagree with me to some degree um, within, within limits of what's respectable there. So um, yeah, I think that's uh, going to be um, quite, quite important moving forward that we, um, we look at the range of, of positions and weigh the, um, the different reasons that people give for why they believe what they believe. Where they don't give reasons, that's the problem. That's where argumentation and debate breaks down. But uh, we, we, we can demand of people that they support the positions they, they hold. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor, for joining us and uh, enlightening us about your research and the pandemic and showing us how to navigate this very weird time that we have. Thank you so much for giving us your time. I've, I've enjoyed it. And uh, thank you for taking on this initiative. I hope it's very successful. Thank you. Thank you, Professor.